Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Introduction to Electron Backscatter Diffraction. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. If you have a question, please submit it through the question pane on your console. Any issues regarding connectivity and webinar viewing will be addressed immediately. We will attempt to answer any questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. If we do not get to your question, we will follow up via email after the webinar. Now I'd like to introduce the speaker for today's webinar. Stuart was first introduced to EBSD as an undergraduate student at Brigham Young University, working with the first system in North America. He then moved on to Yale University to pursue a PhD under Professor, Professor Brent Adams. His thesis research focused on automating the EBSD technique. This effort led to the first fully automated EBSD scans in the fall of 1991 after graduating, Stewart joined Los Alamos National Lab and continued working in microtexture and texture analysis using both the OIM technique and conventional X-ray diffraction. Shortly after TSL was founded, Stewart left Los Alamos and joined the startup company, commercializing the EBS, the OIM technique, working primarily on software development. He has continued in this role through, through the purchase of TSL by EDAX and then Amatech. The original OIM software system at Yale could index approximately one pattern in three seconds. Modern systems have come a long way since those early days, with speeds now exceeding 6,700 index patterns per second. Stuart is closely involved in the continued development of the technique, as well as working with scientists all over the world in applying the technique to their materials research. Now over to Stuart. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, I'm excited to to review or introduce you to EBSD. Um, and basically my goal is to first, we'll talk a little bit about what happens in the microscope and where the EBSD signal comes from. And then uh, we'll go through and, and talk about the how you use EBSD at the microscope and then what you do with the data afterwards in terms of applications. And I'll give you just a brief history to, to kind of finish up. So I want to start with the idea of what is microstructure. When we think of microstructure, we think of things like grain size and shape, and we can see the grain boundaries. Maybe we can see twins, phases, inclusions, pores, voids, all kinds of things. But there are things you can't see, um, obviously, in a conventional micrograph. And that includes things like the chemical composition, the crystal structure, the crystallographic orientation of those crystals. Um, and that's the kind of things that we're going to focus on today is, is how do we find it and, and show and display that information. So the first electron microscopes were actually transmission electron microscopes. And so we'll start there. Um, you have an incident beam which actually transmits through the sample. So you have a transmitted beam going out the other side. Some of the signals come back um, in a reflective mode and some are transmit through. So you might see um, electrons coming off of different energies and different forms. Some are very much at the surface. Some electrons actually go all the way through and get diffracted or, or scattered. Um, and then you also can produce X-ray information, which can give you information about the chemical composition. And you may also get visible light. Now in a scanning electron microscope, we have more of a bulk sample, and so we don't expect any transmission through the sample. Um, and so you have an incident beam, and once again, you get backscattered electrons, secondary electrons, uh, characteristic X-rays, um, OJ electrons, which are very surface sensitive, um, visible light, and form a CL. And if we put detectors into the microscope, then we can see all these various images. Um, and you can see the, at the top right there, you see the X-rays produce uh, EDS signal, energy dispersive spectroscopy, and that gives you the quantitative uh, composition, the chemical composition material. The backscatter electrons will give you information about elemental contrast if you put a backscatter detector in. If you use a secondary detector, which is really the often the primary detector in an SEM. Then you'll get information on topography. Um, you can put a CL detector in and get visible light. 
um, in terms of catholuminescence. And there's other detectors you can put in the microscope as well. But what we're going to do for EBSD now is kind of go somewhat into a hybrid position. We're going to tilt the sample so that electrons can come back out a lot easier, almost in a transmission mode. And so once again, you have the incident beam. You can get it characteristic x-rays. You can get secondary electrons. But the important thing now is we can see diffracted electrons. These are typically elastically scattered, although we will pick up some that are also inelastically scattered. And this is where the EBSD signal comes into play. I'm sorry. Now, uh, Bragg's law is the key point here. Um, and what happens is if you have a plane of atoms, then when the electron beam hits that plane of atoms, it produces cones of diffraction. And these cones intersect the phosphor screen or the detector, and they form the, the images that you see for EBSD. So the edges of those um, bands in, in the pattern there on the right are actually uh, the edges of the cones of diffracted electrons. And this is very helpful because these cones or these bands are what tell us information about our, our crystal. And you can't really see the hyperbolic. It's primarily we, we treat these as straight lines. But in some conditions, you do start to see the hyperbolic nature of the diffraction. Um, and you can see it slightly in this really nice image from silicon. And you can see in this image also, you can see one 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 planes, but you can also see um, higher order, like 222 and 333, you can see in this image. Um, and so you get information from the diffracting planes in your crystal. So the EBSD patterns are obtained by essentially focusing a stationary beam on the sample. And then the diffraction pattern is image on a phosphor screen and captured um, with a camera. Typically today, CMOS cameras or even direct electron um, detection cameras. Um, and that, in those cases, you don't actually use a phosphor screen. The bands represent reflecting planes in the diffracting crystal volumes. So the geometrical arrangement of those bands is, uh, gives you an indication of the orientation of the diffracting crystal lattice. So um, with the EBSD uh, pattern, basically you move the electron beam in the SEM to a point of interest, to a grain of interest, and you can see then the, or the pattern that is produced at that point, and then the orientate from that pattern, you can deduce the orientation of the crystal and the crystal structure, actually. So for example, if I move the beam to a new point, I get a new orientation, and so the the pattern also is changed. And you can see as I move the beam around, the pattern changing due to the change in orientation of the crystals at those points. So there's actually two main application areas that we have for EBSD data. Um, one is what we call orientation imaging, microscopy or OIM, and the other is phase identification. The Imaging, the OIM imaging is actually the much larger of the two, but we're going to start with phase identification and to what 
how that's used. So for phase, phase ID, what we do is we put the beam on a point of interest in our, in our sample, in the microstructure. You can collect an EDS spectrum, for example, from that point. In this case, you can see um, at our point here, we have iron, titanium, and oxygen. And we can also collect an EBSD pattern at that point. Now we take the EDS data, the chemical data, and go to a database and say, okay, what materials are we aware of that have oxygen, iron, and titanium? And you can see here's all the ones from a, a certain database that I've used. And so these are all candidate phases. And with those phases, then we have information like the cubic, the crystal symmetry for the, this example, cubic, tetragonal, trigonal, or thorhombic, hexagonal. And then you also have lattice parameters. Um, and other information. And you can use that information then to try and index the EBSD pattern. If you do that and then they match up well, then you know you've, you've found the, a good solution. In this case, it's the Fe2 TiO4 cubic phase um, with that lattice parameter. The top two are, pro are very similar and it would be unlikely for us to be able to differentiate those two um, using conventional techniques that we use. Now you can do this over and over again with all the different uh, phases that you see in your material and use that to positively identify the uh, crystallographic uh, or the crystal phase associated, crystal structure associated with the points of interest, as you can see in this example from a mineral. So that's very helpful. Um, and there is some use of that, but like I said, that's somewhat of a uh, secondary use of EBSD. Let's go on to orientation imaging microscopy or mapping. So in EBSD mapping, what we're gonna do is we're going to um, move the beam to a specific point on the crystal and then define a scan area and then collect points or collect data at each point within the scan grid. So in this case, at each red dot there, we will collect a pattern. From that, we will deduce the orientation through uh, various uh, image analysis. And then we record that data, record the crystal orientation. We, we may even record the pattern. We also record information on the quality of the pattern, how well we've indexed it, and other data. And what that does is that allows us then to use that data to reconstruct an orientation map. And that's done by shading each point in our scan area with a color that's indicative of the orientation. In this case, the crystallographic um, direction that's aligned with the sample normal. So you see there, a point in blue um, has a one on one or it's essentially um, corner to corner of the cube. The red points um, basically are face on. Those are the 001 orientations. And then the edge orientations are the green ones. Those have 110 uh, bands sticking up. So those are edge, edge on edge. Since we know the orientation at each point, we also know the orientation difference or disorientation or misorientation um, between those points. And that allows us then to characterize the boundaries and it tells us the degree of orientation difference across the boundaries. So in this case, the red ones you see are highly uh, disoriented from uh, one grain to another, whereas the blue ones are just a small difference in orientation. So those could even potentially be subgrains depending upon your definition. Um, just to give you an idea here, we have, uh, a spatial resolution typically of around 20 nanometers with EBSD. It depends a lot upon the microscope conditions, the sample itself. Um, we can get down to a uh, finer uh, with transmission Kikuchi diffraction, which I won't go into. It's another level, higher level um, use of EBSD. The angular resolution is typically on a, about a third of a degree. We can improve that to, by an order of magnitude through some refinement techniques. And then there's some high level analysis that allows us to get to even uh, two orders of magnitude um, improved uh, orientation precision. As uh, 
we mentioned at the beginning, the automation now, we can get over 6,000 points per second, um, even faster today. Um, and that allows us then to reconstruct the microstructures really well using the EBSD data. So the spatial resolution in this case um, is affected by a variety of things. And it's key, the key point is the interaction volume. So a couple of key things that affect the interaction volume are one, the spot size, and that's just a, generally the amount of current. So it's the, it's, it's the size of the incoming beam. So you can adjust the current and that will reduce then the uh, spot size, which then in turn reduces the interaction volume. The voltage also affects the, uh, the, the interaction volume, but it tends to be more of a depth effect than a lateral resolution effect. We typically operate at 20 kV, but we can go down to e actually even less than 5 kV, but the patterns get more difficult to index. Same is true for the current. The lower the current, the weaker the patterns. And so there's a trade-off in terms of that with spatial resolution. With higher Z materials, we're better reflectors. So in, in terms of a balanced approach, you would you could use less current and thereby get better resolution in those materials. And then operating conditions. Are we focused on speed? Are we focused on the quality of the patterns? All those will affect the resolution. Um, the faster we go, the less drift we have due to contamination of the surface um, or buildup of electrons on the surface. So what can I do with this data? Well, we have a variety of things um, in our software that you can do. One is you can do uh, these maps, which I've been showing. I'll show some more. We can do various statistical analyses um, and show that in some kind of chart data or plot data. And then we can do um, orientation plots in terms of discrete orientations, or we can do and analyze that data using statistical analysis, uh, multidimensional analysis, um, to get an idea of what we call the texture. And texture is basically a measure of preferred orientation. So just as an example, here's a map of a rock um, with quite a few different minerals in it. And in this case, we used EDS and EBSD together to find uh, where, you know, the arrangement of the phases in the material. So on the right, the colors represent the different phases and you can see there we have seven different phases. On the left, um, we see the orientation, and each one of the phases would have a different color triangle, but I, I don't show them all here. I wanna show an example from a meteorite. This is the Gibeon meteorite that was discovered in 1836. Um, it broke into many different fragments, but we have, we're given a small piece to look at. Um, th this actually is a very coarse grain material. And if you look closely, you can see this uh, EBSD map is actually constructed using very many um, uh, fields together, and then we stitch together to capture the microstructure. And you can see then the different uh, kind of stringers of data there uh, of the, in the microstructure, kind of a lamellar microstructure. And this is actually two different phases. Um, Here's another example, a, a nice example from a uh, deposition from colleague, former colleague Jeff Fair. And what you see here is you see a substrate, an indium uh, or MGO substrate, and then on top of that is an indium oxide film that is grown. And what you see initially is you, uh, near the, the interface between the substrate and the film is several blue grains. A lot, it's dominated by blue grains, and these are 111 oriented. And then as the film grows, they start to change color. Um, and you can see somewhat of a preference to an 001 direction. Uh, Jeff looked at a much larger area and that is indeed borne out statistically. So what you have is nucleation at one orientation and then growth um, at a different orientation. And you can see that effect in the EBSD results. Similarly, here's an example of dendrite growth um, where we've captured uh, the growth of dendrites along with uh, some AFM data and you can see then how the how the dendrites grow in different directions the green one there um, actually is a 100 direction and then you have you can see how those twins form so you can get some really inform cool information about the roughness and how that correlates with 
crystallography and then how the growth occurs. Other examples um, are you can correlate EBSD data with various other types of material behavior. In this case, um, this, these authors looked at electrochemical behavior as a function of orientation. So you can see on the left is an orientation map from the EBSD. On the right shows the, um, actually it's a thickness map. And so it gives you an idea of, of which, which ones are oxidizing faster based on the thickness. And so you can see then the correlation um, in those different grains. And you can perform statistical analyses to understand that. Another example are phase transformations. So there's an orientation relationship typically between a phase before and after um, a phase transformation. In this case, we start out with this beta, it's cobalt. We start out with a, a hexagonal phase. You can see there the, where the basal pole is, the 001 pole. And then after heating, you can see the transformation to a uh, cubic phase, or sorry, vice versa, but you can see now the relationship between those two phases, and you can see that the 111 um, direction is aligned with the basal C axis um, in the hexagonal phase. And so you can learn, you can deduce sometimes from EBSD data, you can deduce these orientation relationships, and you can do all kinds of analysis um, before and after the phase transformations. I mentioned grain boundaries, and grain boundaries can be important because they can be uh, have specific properties or they can affect the overall properties of the bulk. This is a, a great example of a grain boundary engineered material. You can see on the left, there's very few special boundaries, and on the right, there's a lot of special boundaries. So after uh, charging and discharging a battery, you can see how the material with lots of special boundaries perform much better. And the special boundaries in this case are essentially twins and secondary twins. And those are the ones that are colored um, in this example. And you can see there's a lot of twins in this material. I've always been interested in these kind of examples. I, I find them quite interesting. This is an example of a, an ancient prehistoric cauldron from the sec second century BC that was found in a bog in Denmark. And you can see then the microstructure, lots of twins in this as well. The hope was is they could, uh, from a this very small sample from the cauldron, they could maybe get an idea of how to prevent it from corroding um, to preserve it. One of the biggest uses of EBSD is to study plastic deformation of materials. And plastic deformation is generally controlled by dislocations. And those can show up two different ways. Sometimes the dislocations uh, group together to form subgrain boundaries, as you see there. And then other times you just have local perturbations within grains. And these show up different ways in the, in the EBSD results. So consider some, in, if, we, if we had an interaction volume that were, was surrounding a dislocation, as I show here, and this would be a statistically stored dislocation, then it um, leads to degraded patterns. And that's because um, you would have a, a diffusive effect due to the, the, uh, the Bragg's Law being satisfied um, differently in different parts of that um, structure. But if we go to a more of a grain boundary type approach or subgrain of boundary created by a dislocation, in this case, you can kind of think of this as a GND, then essentially what you have is you have a three different patterns from within the interaction volume. And those kind of interfere with each other and also lead to a degraded pattern in the end. So this is an example um, from zirconium. On the left, are, it's unstrained, beautiful patterns, really sharp. After strain, then you, after plastic strain, you can see the pattern is much more diffuse. And this is due to both effects, both um, from the statistically stored dislocations, the SSD, as well as the um, GNTs. So just to show you on a, on a real sample, this is a, a partially crystallized material. You can see two effects here. If you look here in this uh, grain, in, in the blue examples, the one you can see in a recrystallized grain, a nice sharp pattern, and you can see then in a deformed grain, you can see a poor pattern. Now within those, even in that area with deformation, 
as you move around, you can actually see subtle changes in orientation. You see the, the pattern essentially almost shimmer as you move the beam around. Um, and there's just slight changes in orientation due to, or slight changes in the patterns due to slight changes in orientation. If you look at that really close, you can see the difference in orientation. There's a slight movement of the major poles, especially that one at the top right. You can see it shifts just slightly. And this can be used to analyze the strain in materials. So this shows up in the maps in a couple of different ways. So here's a, an example of steel that's partially recrystallized. You can see in the, the recrystallized, the pattern on the left, or the map on the left is a pattern quality map. We call it an image quality map. So you can see the, the recrystallized grains are nice and clean, whereas the areas that are deformed, you can see that they are much darker. And this is the pattern quality. Now, another way to look at that is to look at the changes in orientation. And this shows up as slight variations in color. So you can see in the recrystallized grains, the color is solid. It doesn't change much, whereas in the deformed areas and recovered areas, you can see uh, pretty strong uh, color gradients. And, and some of the grains in this example, they vary in orientation as much as 30 degrees from one end of the sample, or one end of the grain to the other. And this can be used then to study things like dislocation, or dislocations, deformation, and recrystallization. Here's an example of dynamic uh, recrystallization, or recrystallization in a dynamic experiment and it's in situ experiment where we heated up the sample. So you, as you watch here, you can see grains start to grow um, and see the deform some deformed areas take longer before they recrystallize, but eventually um, it will all recrystallize. So it's a nice example of EBSD and how deformation appears um, in these materials. Another example, EBSD is, is also used in the earth sciences. Um, this is a fun example um, from trilobites, which are uh, marine arthropods that uh, appear in the fossil record. Their eyes were composed of crystalline uh, calcite, CaCO3. And in that, uh, you get a double image unless you're looking through it in a parallel to the C-axis. So you can see an example that I, you can see two images of the trilobite um, from underneath. So in order for their eyes to be effective, they had to have had an uh, organized microstructure. So here's a EBSD of, a, of one of these calcite eyes. And what you see is that the orientation of C-axis start basically look up and then bend over. And what they have found is that the amount of bending varies with uh, where the, the, basically the animal is found in the, would have been found in the sea. Um, the, the ones that uh, were deeper would have less bending, and those that are shallow would have more bending to help them find prey or to avoid being prey <laughs> or preyed upon. So um, another example is some bio, biomaterials. This is a chicken egg and an ostrich egg, and you can see the microstructures are actually quite different. Um, in the ostrich egg, you see this alignment of C-axis. In the chicken egg, you can see it almost, they look like recrystallized grains, the color solid, whereas the ostrich egg, they, they vary in orientation. And an interesting note about this is if you look in the fossil record at two different types of uh, dinosaurs and look at the eggs, you will see some correlation to what we saw um, in the chicken and the ostrich eggs, giving us some idea of, of kind of how these eggs were and, and some ideas about the the life cycle of, the, of these animals. Now, an important use of EBSD is also in helping us predict properties and improve our properties modeling. So materials are all anisotropic. We all know that wood's anisotropic. We understand the idea of grain. We'd much rather do a karate chop on the top one there versus the bottom one. But even metallic crystals have orient, have and isotropy. So it's a little more obvious in something like uh, titanium, where you have a, have a crystal hexagonal crystal structure like this. You can imagine that strength, conductivity, other materials properties would be affected by um, 
how the in this example what if the strain if this material were strained vertically versus horizontally would we expect the material response to be different and so you could argue that well isn't the anisotropy essentially averaged out in a bulk crystal or a bulk material it really depends upon something called texture and texture is the idea of uh, preferred orientation geologists tend to use the term fabric or cpo but this example here, the microstructure on the left has very little texture, whereas the microstructure on the right has a very strong texture. All those grains are almost the same orientation. So you can think in terms of texture, the left being a weak or random texture, and one on the right being a strong texture. And just as an example, this is one of my first uh, applications of EBSD, and I still think it's a good one in showing the effect of EBS of crystal orientation. So on the right is an EBSD map, and you can see the red is 001 aligned with the essentially the compression axis, whereas at the center line material, it's mostly blue. And so that's an area that's uh, 111. And so if you were to, um, compress this material, I mean, traditionally you would expect it to form somewhat of a barrel shape, but in this case, it formed an hourglass shape. And that's not to say that the center shrunk, just that the ends expanded much more quickly than the material at the center line um, during compression. And this is due then to the alignment of crystal planes um, with the compression axis and how slip occurs. And so we're, you can actually model that using um, the EBSD data and go to, you can see here, we get a really good capturing of that hourglass shape from the modeling effort. You could also uh, look at elastic anisotropy. Um, in this case, you can see Young's modulus um, for each of these four different orientations. And then if you average all the material together, you can see the bulk average modulus. And so you can predict the anisotropic um, elastic response of this material to a given stress state. And here's um, three different uh, uh, copper samples, uh, two thin films and one rolled. And you can see the results on the bulk texture there, the bulk Young's modulus um, for each of these three different samples. Um, and they all have quite different. The first two are very are quite similar, but you can see the strength is of the, the texture is much stronger in the first example, and so you get a more anisotropic um, modulus. When the modulus is a sphere, that's when you have isotropy. Some of the exciting areas that have come about uh, with 3D EBSD over the years, so it's one is 3D serial sectioning. This is some nice examples from Dave Roanhorse group. So this is AM316 stainless. There's 308 sections. So what Dave has done is use a robot, actually, and he mechanically polishes between each section to remove a little bit of material, puts it back in the microscope, does an EBSD scan, and repeats that process. And so you get a 3D, you can reconstruct the 3D data and see that you get these really long, elongated grains that was somewhat surprising when you go to 3D data, and you don't capture that those, those grain shapes um, when you look at individual sections. And so in this image, we're just showing the 10 largest grain clusters, and you can see the grains there. Interesting clusters of grains together. So that kind of concludes uh, applications. There's a lot more, and if you look at, peruse the data, or the, the scientific literature, you'll see a lot. A little bit of history, the actually very first uh, patterns came from Kikuchi in 1928. He called them P patterns. From, and these are from calcite, you can see they're quite weak. But then as early as the 30s, we got these wide angle Kikuchi patterns was the name then, and you get these beautiful images. Um, these are done with the vacuum tubes, they're not done in an SEM. The first SEM work was done much later in 1973 by Venables Group at uh, University of Bristol. And then David Dingley also followed that up. He's also in Bristol uh, several years later to develop an online indexing system. I actually had the chance to use this. And in this, you have to click on, you have to recognize, for example, a 110 pole and a 112 pole. And I could do cubics and maybe a hexagonal, but it was really difficult. As part of uh, my PhD thesis, 
we worked on automating the indexing and came up with a technique to do that. Um, and we could get about one pattern every four seconds. We were able to fully automate the technique in the microscope. And you can see this is one of the very first scans we were able to do, see the microstructure. We've come a long way since those days, both in terms of speed, but also in terms of applications. It's been personally gratifying to see how many people are using the technique. Uh, this is just an idea of, of papers in the scientific literature over the years. And you can see it continues to grow, which I'm always amazed by how many people use it, how much they use it, and the variety really of applications. Um, not only in the material science and, and metallurgy, but also in the earth sciences, um, and even some biomaterials um, and even biological samples. So I find that uh, pretty exciting. So that concludes uh, my presentation today. Um, I guess I'm repeating. I thought I had a finishing slide, but I guess I've lost it somewhere. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Jonathan. Thanks, Stu. Uh, we've got some questions that came in. Um, First one, what is minimum acceleration voltage required to get good EBSD data? Um, I, we, we have a hard time doing mapping. Um, it's difficult to do mapping for anything really less than 5 uh, kV, and even 10 kV can be quite challenging. So we typically operate at 20 kV unless we have a special condition. And we have found we typically don't do the really low KV work unless we're using a direct electron detector. Um, the phosphor detector we, is not sensitive enough for those low KVs to capture the weak signal uh, that we get in those patterns. Okay. Um, can you explain how to prepare an organometallic crystal sample uh, for EBSD analysis? Ooh, organo and metallic. I would probably have to <laughs> talk to some of my colleagues who do more sample preparation. But bringing up sample preparation is, a, is an important point. Uh, EBSD is very much a surface technique, and thus preparation of the surface is important. If you have a deformed surface or a fracture surface, you can get some patterns, but it can be difficult to map. If you impart too much deformation when you're um, trying to mechanically polish, then what you'll capture is a deformed microstructure even on a recrystallized material. And so you have to really be careful to in your polishing to prepare really a, a nice finish. And it's not so much a, being a mirror finish, uh, you know, that that's great, but the key is, is to have a finish that is really, uh, doesn't have any deformation coming from, from the polishing technique. And so that's quite important. We, we do a lot of mechanical polishing, but uh, if on the really difficult samples, we might finish with a broad beam ion polish or a chemical um, polish of some kind. Okay, kind of a follow-up question to that one. Um, is it possible to analyze organic crystals and protein crystals in EBSD? And if so, how do you do it? Um, to be honest, we have not had much luck. We seem, tend to try it every few years. The challenge we have is with the beam, um, even if we use a really weak beam, a, a low KV beam, we have a hard time seeing um, patterns as the beam gets destroyed. We do now have a direct electron detector and we are using that at low KV. Um, and so we have seen some patterns, but we haven't really developed any techniques to, for example, to analyze um, the protein patterns. Um, but we have done a few polymers um, but once again, not indexing, just capturing patterns. And then from that, you can do some imaging just from patterns directly. We call that the Prius technique. And we have done some of that work and we can see some structure, but nothing like we see with the metal. So yes, please try. I'm always excited to see what people are, are able to accomplish. And, um, but to, to be fair, we haven't had a, a great amount of success yet. What is the effect of stress on the collection of Kikuchi patterns? Um, so if the stress is just creates a uh, elastic uh, response, then we won't see a lot of effect in the patterns. There will be very subtle movement of the poles 
or uh, where the, where all these bands intersect, those poles will shift slightly or zone axes, they'll shift slightly. Um, and when I say slightly, I mean um, in fractions of a pixel. And so that can be quite difficult to detect, but there are techniques based on uh, cross correlation of patterns that are, and that whole work is embodied in what we call HREBSD in the community. If the stress is such that, like the example I showed for that compressed tantalum cylinder and you get deformation, then what you'll see is you'll see slight changes in orientation from point to point within the microstructure. And you can capture that to, to a large degree using EBSD. Um, and you can, there you're looking at very small changes in orientation, less than a degree, less than a tenth of a degree. And from that, you can deduce the geometrically necessary dislocation. There's been some nice experiments um, comparing those results to techniques like ECCI or um, with TEM results to get an idea of, of the deformation of the material. So yes, that's a, a big area um, for studies is, is deformation with EBSD. Okay, this is a multi-part question. Um, first part is, uh, do you have a recommendation for reconstructing austenite grains and steels after quenching? Uh, the purpose is to identify the recrystallized grains formed during hot deformation. Uh, this person reconstructed them, but still there's a few regions of artificial effects inside the reconstructed grain, and they want to know which feature represents them better. Um, yeah, the, we did a webinar uh, a while back on this reconstruction technique, um, and we are always improving the software, so we have techniques to do that reconstruction. There's also third-party techniques, um, so you might want to try those and compare them to see which artifacts either are present in all techniques, <laughs> all reconstruction techniques, or which ones may, you know, uh, be captured better. Um, by the different algorithms. So uh, in terms of what to look for, you know, yes, we do see some artifacts. Um, what I typically try to do is, you know, it kind of depends on what you're chasing. If you're, if you're just after capturing the grain size, maybe you can throw out the artifacts through some kind of filtering of the data and just focus on the grains that are, are well reconstructed. Um, if you're trying to do more uh, analysis, such as maybe, the deformation within the grains, then maybe you're, once again, you're going to have to do some kind of, I don't want to say manual analysis, but some kind of more sophisticated analysis of your data and, you know, excluding the, the artifact, the regions with artifacts. Um, I would say, <laughs> we, we say this a lot, if it were easy, it wouldn't be science, right? So we do have these challenges. EBSD can provide incredible information. Um, but even there, we're going to have to, to do some studies and, and really dig into our data at times to understand it fully. Okay, the next question is, uh, is there an alternative detector for one with a phosphor screen? Yes, uh, we have a detector we call the Clarity. This is a direct electron detector, so it actually counts the electrons that hit uh, the detector itself. This gives us really terrific um, sensitivity. Um, and it's not as fast, so but it really gives us beautiful patterns. So it has kind of two functions for us that we've found so far. One is that, um, like I said, it, it's really helpful when we have to work at low KV, say beam sensitive materials or materials with um, very fine grains um, or re spatial resolutions uh, a concern. And then it also helps us capture details in the patterns that we can't capture the phosphor screen. Because we get sharper patterns, we can look at strain effects better. We can look um, at potentially phase effects, and we can capture things like um, asymmetry in the crystals. Um, so we can start to look at non-symmetrical, central symmetric crystals and be able to index and resolve um, the pseudosymmetry effects in those. Uh, how how do you determine the proper step size based on the grain size before EBSD mapping? Uh, there are there you know there are some standards both uh, ASTM and ISO have produced some guidelines for those kind of measurements if what you're interested in is grain size. Um, my rule of thumb is to try if I'm you know trying to reconstruct the microstructure to at least 
at the very minimum get um, 25 points per average uh, grain. So, you know, basically five in the horizontal, five in, in the vertical directions. Um, that's my original rule of thumb. But now that systems are so much faster, I would probably almost um, increase that by an order of magnitude. It really depends. What are you trying to capture? If you're just after texture, you could have one point per average grain. You'd be fine and just collect a lot of grains. If you're after grain size, then yeah, you're going to need to get more grains per, or more points per grain. If you're interested in effects right at the grain boundaries, you're going to want a lot of points per grain so that you can capture those really sensitive changes near the grain boundaries or at triple junctions like in deformation studies. So yes, a rule of thumb, there are various rules of thumbs, but there's more than one because there's more than one thing that we're trying to study. Okay. Um, can you elaborate on why uh, a, a polished scratch-free surface is needed for EBSD analysis? It really goes back to those slides I showed on deformation. I hate to go backwards, but it's probably worth a quick discussion there. So the idea here is, is that as if we were to have a scratch, we've pushed some material around. And so we've got dislocations in our material. And so what you get are these subtle changes um, in orientation. And so you can imagine if the beam is in the part of this crystal that's in blue, I'll get one pattern. If part of the beam is in the red one, I get another pattern. If, if the beam is in the green one, I get another pattern. So in reality, the interaction volume, because these, these, these are small changes, will cover all three grains. And so you will get a microstructure, you'll get a pattern that is basically a superposition of all three. And so you kind of smear out the edges of those bands and you don't, you get patterns that look like these. Um, and so it can be harder to analyze and get good data um, when you have strained material. Now, having said that, we can definitely index that pattern on the right. No problem. We can get the orientation from that. Um, it's just, you know, do you want your, data to be from your you know your material that you're trying to capture you don't want your data to be really from the the polishing so you can imagine i have a recrystallized material i put a big old scratch in it now i've got a now i'm looking at a deformed microstructure when in reality that's not what's in the bulk and so it really comes down to we want a representative we want the microstructure we measure to be representative of the material itself and not representative of just the polished surface. Hopefully that makes some sense. Okay. What can I do if only half the Kikuchi pattern is well defined? Um, if there's enough for the um, Huff, what we call the Huff transform to detect the bands, you'll be fine. Um, but we also have some new techniques um, based on what we call pattern matching. And those new techniques are much better at dealing with, uh, for example, rough surfaces where you may have shadowing or intensity gradients across the pattern. So if you've got a really difficult surface, say an as deposited or a fracture surface, then you may want to um, use these new techniques and, and contact us. Um, so we have various tools in the software um, and modules to add on to the software that can help in these conditions. Having said that, if you do have very rough surfaces, we have found that just a quick broad beam ion polish, even on that rough surface, can clean up some of these issues. And sometimes if you have a really difficult surface, just doing a quick polish so you don't really destroy the surface, just to kind of clean it up just a little bit will help as well. Um, how high can you increase the sample temperature to do EBSD without damaging the detector? Um, it's that's a really good question. It's a, a lot of it's about volume. So with, we do have in situ, there are in situ um, heating stages out there and strain and temperature stages out there. And as long as the beam is small and the area, you know, the volume of material that's actually being heated is small, it's often not too big of a deal. We have gone to samples over a thousand degrees C. Um, but if you, yeah, if you're trying to do a big bulk, then you're going to have a problem. Um, 
and you may want to, you know, protect your, if, if, a, if a lot's going on um, and you're doing it in situ work, then you might want to protect the detector and some retract it and then put it back in um, when you're in a calmer or less uh, invasive situation with the sample. Um, we have not done a lot of in situ work yet with our direct electron detector. It's more expensive, so we do get more concerned. With the other, the phosphor screen-based detectors, replacing the phosphor is not the end of the world, so it's it's not too as big of a deal. And we can look at you know IR, IR filters and things like that. The other thing you have to worry about is if you're heating it to the point where you're getting light, then that's going to be a problem as well. Um, that's going to affect the patterns as well. Um, how do you differentiate between elastic and plastic mapping in EBSD? Um, so plastic mapping, we can see through subtle changes in orientation. Um, with elastic, what you see actually is the patterns themselves slightly distort. And so to really look at elastic, you're going to have to use this high resolution EBSD or HR EBSD technique, which is based on cross correlation of patterns. If you're just looking, I shouldn't say just, if you're looking at plastic strain only, then we can measure that by these subtle changes in orientation that we can detect with traditional EBSD work. Okay, um, can you explain why a 70 degree sample tilt is used? Uh, it's really about escaping the electrons escaping we can do it flat um, but so few of the electrons return to the detector um, we have to reposition the detector in a new place as well um, that the patterns are much weaker and so you could do you know you could do a piece of tantalum or nickel or something that, that scatters well but it's really difficult to do uh, you know more typical samples and so 70 degrees is a little bit of a historical reason um, from some of the first samples that were looked at 70 degrees was a good geometry um, we you could actually you can operate it even higher or even lower it kind of you'll you'll see the effect on the patterns 70 just seems to be a good balance and happy medium it is a challenge i agree to work at high tilt that creates various distortions in the in the resulting images and the geometries in the microscope are more difficult to work with but we do get our best results um, at the higher tilts. Okay. How did you get the elastic slash mechanical properties of the different grains? Is this a simulated result? Yes, that's a simulated result. So from a single crystal, we know the elastic constants, we know the orientation, and so we just basically take um, the, the model for Young's modulus and rotate it um, by the orientation of the crystal that we know. What is the impact of pores in EBSD and how do they affect the pattern? Uh, I think some of the examples I showed, yeah, from this one right here. So this one has some embrittlement at grain boundaries, so it has some pores of the grain boundaries, and so we don't get we get patterns that um, really don't have any signal. They're just amorphous, essentially, and so we don't get a, a result. And that's measured. Um, we measure both the quality of the patterns as well as our confidence in our indexing result. So we can filter out the pores um, or whatever reason we don't get a pattern. It could be a pore. It could be we don't get them from pores cracks for example but you may also have maybe an amorphous grain or amorphous phase in your material and from those points you wouldn't get patterns either so from the patterns themselves we don't know necessarily what's causing us not to get a result um, but you know we would try to compare that against um, you know the SEM image for example your information from the secondary detector or a backscatter detector and then we could by correlating those, we would know which ones are pores and which may be other features. Okay, uh, what's the significance of the numbers associated with the color maps on the EBSD poll figures? Ah, that's a good question. Do I have? 
So the numbers um, along that triangle there, you have 001, which is a direction normal to the face of a cube. 110 or 101 or 0111, there is the edge of a cube. 111 is the corner of a cube. And because of symmetry, um, you have, for example, if you think of a die, <laughs> you have uh, you have six faces, so there's six different 001s. There's 001, 00 minus 1, 010, uh, 100, and then they're negative reciprocals of those. And then you have all the edges. So you have uh, however many edges are on a cube? What, eight? No, eight plus 12. Um, one on ones, you have all the corners of a cube. And so those are what the numbers mean, and they tell us then they're a way of, of kind of helping us visualize. Uh, how the cube is oriented. And then, of course, if you have other crystal symmetries, then it becomes uh, more difficult. Hexagonal one's pretty easy to imagine. You have a, a, what we call the 0001, which is the C axis, and then you have the, the other axes. Um, and we use a four index notation for, for hexagonal. Um, if you go to things like monoclinic and triclinic, it becomes a little more complicated, um, but certainly doable with, with some practice. How does carbon coding affect the EBSD analysis data? Uh, yeah, carbon coding can can help um, if you're if you're looking at an insulator, say a ceramic, coating it with carbon can certainly help. You want that to be a relatively thin coating so that the electrons can both get in and then come back out. It's really the coming back out that's the issue. Um, so you do need to be careful and use a thin coating. Uh, we've also seen results with uh, gold or other things. I think carbon's probably better because it's uh, less of a scatterer, so it's less inhibiting uh, to the diffracting electrons returning back to the phosphor screen. Um, you could also study those kind of materials with a uh, um, uh, with a low vacuum instrument, a SEM, um, an environmental SEM. Although I'm not seeing that as much as I used to, um, so I think. And the other option is to try to work at lower KVs and to work quickly. Um, maybe get your experiment set up in an area away from the region you actually want to look at. And then once you pull your region of interest into view, you know, make sure you're all ready to go and hit the go button and let it go as fast as possible so that you build up less, um, less electrons on the surface so that you get less drift. Okay. Uh, one of the sample mounts you showed was epoxy. Does charging the SEM affect EBSD patterns, and what kind of atmosphere in the chamber is typically used for EBSD? Well, we use, I mean, we typically use a standard SEM, so it's not a UHV, just a standard vacuum. But if we do have a sample mounted in an epoxy mount, then we need to make sure we have a trail of conductivity um, so we can ground it. And so we'll use, uh, you know, silver paint, carbon paint um, to to go over there, but or to to basically create a wire to to a, to the um, stage. But having said that, we found we get better results actually if we essentially put a mask over the sample and then you know carbon coat the whole thing or, or gold coat the whole sample. Um, and then pull off the mass so that we, we're just looking at the region of interest um, that way. We tend to get less drift and better results um, using that approach. Okay. Uh, can EBSD be performed on TEM samples? Yes. Um, that is the thing I referenced slightly called TKD. We use a very different uh, arrangement. We actually tilt the other direction and maybe only to 30 degrees. Um, but we can use the EBSD detector um, to image the material. It's a slightly different process. The data comes, the signal all comes from the bottom of the sample instead of the top. So you have to think about that a little bit. Um, and it will be affected by the thickness. Um, but we call that TKD and we can get results that way. And that helps us improve the, the spatial resolution as well. Okay. Uh, how extensive is the database for phase identification? Ah, 
So we have a couple different approaches. We can use our database, which has about 500, 500 uh, samples in it or 500 phases in it. But if you're really doing phase ID and it's something really unknown, then you'll have to use one of the big uh, databases. There's a couple of online ones that we can kind of interact with. There's also the probably the biggest one we work with is called the PDF 4 Plus from the International Centers of Diffraction Data. And that one has, I think the current version has all, over a million. Um, having said that, Phase ID has kind of, I, won't, I wanna say fallen out of favor, but I don't see it used that much. Um, so I'll be be'd love to see somebody revitalize and show um, more interest and, and feedback on how to improve those, those capabilities. Uh, what is the optimum probe current used for EBSD to generate data? I think I had it. We have one slide just to kind of give an idea. Um, so that you see the current there, just kind of a typical current. With our direct electron detector, we can go to currents in the picoamps and get results. So it really depends upon what material you're looking at, how much scatter, and as well as the detector that you have for the system, and your SEM, how concentrated is the beam, how concentrated is that current. So um, I'm there's probably um, one of my colleagues could probably give you some better a better answer, but I think that's a general general rule of thumb there. Uh, how can we implement EBSD to find residual stress? Uh, this kind of goes back to the questions I think we've already had on plastic deformation. The key is to look at the change, the small changes in orientation with the ingrain changes in orientation, and that's a way of, of, of getting at the stress. If we want to actually get out the, the deformation tensor, um, then that will require HREBSD, and with that, you can get uh, more precise results. Okay. Do you have any suggestions on how to do EBSD on plate martin martin site in steel? Uh, the martin site question is a great question. It's an active area of within the community of research. We can, if we treat the martin site as a a BCC crystal, then we're fine. It's very difficult for us to capture the beast, the actual tetragonal nature of the Martin site. Um, there are various research groups working on this problem and various ideas have come up. We can see if the Martin site um, tetragonality is say 5%, we can see that. Um, if it's down less than 2%, that becomes more and more difficult. So because the Martin site C over A ratio changes with carbon content, we're gonna see a, a, a variation through the microstructure most likely. So capturing that is still really an area of research. Um, some of the new uh, dictionary or what we call spherical indexing techniques seem like show some promise to help uh, resolve these issues, but at this point it's still uh, kind of a research area. Are there any efforts in machine learning in predicting properties of grains? Uh, for predicting properties, yes, there have been some studies, machine learning. Um, there's also been machine learning on phase identification, uh, basically pulling out the Lowy group from the patterns without any prior knowledge. So yes, machine learning is starting to be applied. I wouldn't say it's definitely, I wouldn't say it's routine at any point. Uh, at this point, but uh, I would say watch this space. I think we'll see more and more. Uh, is it possible to obtain EBSD patterns uh, for thin films of less than 20 nanometers thickness? If yes, any suggestions on how to do so? 20 nanometers is really thin. <laughs> uh, the, the only thing I can suggest for the really thin films is to increase the tilt. But the problem is then you're smearing that beam out over a larger area. And like you can imagine this picture here that's on the screen now. If if you were to tilt that even more, then that beam's going to cover more grains. And so you're, it's going to affect the interaction volume. Uh, that's, you know, off the cuff, that's the best suggestion I have at this point. Okay. I think that's all we're going to have time for today. Okay. Um, 
Stu, thank you so much for your excellent presentation. Sorry about some of the sound problems. No, no problem. It was a very short period at the beginning, so I think we're okay. Okay. Um, if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to email us. If we didn't get to your question, we will answer you via email. Um, and thank you again. Thanks, everyone.